Mr. Bear, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. Uh, I would notice, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes after your talk, how gracious you are. You know, 12 years or so after being exposed to Bitcoin, you know, people tend to uh, uh, fade out once they've made some kind of uh, impact. And I just really appreciate out of all of the people in the crypto space, you're one of those advocates uh, that just talk about libertarian values and uh, maybe the use cases of cryptocurrency. If you don't mind, just for the audience to kind of get a refresher uh, on stage, I learned so much about your origin story in Silicon Valley. That's that's really an intention I had as well. But if you can just highlight a little bit of the content that you put on stage at Nomad Capitalist, that'd be great. Yeah, so I was born and raised in the Silicon Valley. Um, had a tech business there, had some uh, run-ins with law enforcement. How much detail do you, would, would you like? Well, you know, uh, memory dealers and things like that. I think you said your, about your origin story. I don't know if that was inspired by your family, as far as your libertarian views, your entrepreneurism and things like that. But of course, before you became known as Bitcoin Jesus and uh, your evangelism of uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, you were still inspired to deliver value to the, the masses, I think, through software or uh, business. Yeah, I, I guess if I had to, give credit to one person in particular for my libertarian values I have today was a, would be my grandfather, who I didn't know at the time at all, but apparently he had written some articles for the Foundation for Economic Education previously, and had donated a bunch of money to the, the FEE as well, and uh, I think he had donated a bunch of money to uh, Barry Goldwater, which was before either of our times, but uh, reading about him in the past, he seems like, not that I'm a fan of any president, but probably was one of the best presidential candidates in the, in the last hundred years. Uh, Maybe him and Ron Paul are probably the, the two best ones there. But uh, he had sent my mother a book called Socialism by Ludwig von Mises. And at the time, I had no idea what socialism was, didn't know who von Mises was, wasn't even really entirely sure what capitalism was. I, I just kind of knew Americans are supposed to like capitalism and not supposed to like socialism. And I know it's probably like the summer before freshman year in high school, like after eighth grade, and my mom said, you know, no more playing video games. You, to have to go outside or read a book or do something other than video games or using the computer. So I looked on the bookshelf and on the bookshelf was this book, Socialism, that my mother had never read, but my grandfather had gifted at some point and said, oh, I figure I should at least hear both sides of the argument. And I pick up this book thinking that it was a pro-socialist book. And for anybody that's read this book or is familiar with Mises, I, I think it was the Wall Street Journal or somebody termed uh, the book as the Ludwig von Mises' devastating critique of socialism. And the book basically points out that without prices, you have no idea what resources should be used to produce what goods. And the pricing system and the money that transmits those prices is so incredibly important to allow people all over the world to collaborate with each other to produce the things that we need. And how in you know, communist Russia, if they didn't have money in the price system, you had no idea should the streets be paved with asphalt or gold, or you, know, you have no idea what should be produced out of what other goods. And so when you finish reading this, you realize, wow, Anytime the government messes in the economy in any way whatsoever, it's distorting the allocation of those resources to produce the most amount of goods for people around the world. And it was really, really interesting. And so like, I started studying more and more economics and I found you know, Milton Friedman and Leonard Reed and then eventually somehow I found my way to Murray Rothbard and that's like what really changed my view of the world. And there's a, fan, there's a bunch of fantastic books by Murray Rothbard, but one, uh, uh, people will be intimidated by it. It's called Man, Economy, and State, and I don't know, I think it looks like 800 pages or something, but it is very readable. You just have to sit down and take the time. Like, you're not gonna fall asleep and doze off. Like, it's a really readable book, and you will see the world much more clearly and understand so much more about how the world works after reading anything by Murray Rothbard. But uh, Man, Economy, and State is fantastic. Then he has another uh, book, uh, The Ethics of Liberty, is also really, really changed the way you uh, view the world. And so I started reading all of these books, and then I started realizing, wow, like anytime the government's interfering in the economy, they're pre preventing the world from becoming as prosperous and wealthy and raising everyone's standard of living as much as it could possibly be. And so I wanted to tell people about this. And so I did everything I could to start spreading the word. And lo and behold, eventually, if you speak out against, you know, politicians and get people in you know, government power, they'll come after you. And I wound up actually serving uh, 10 months in federal prison for selling firecrackers on eBay without a license, even though the company I was buying the firecrackers from were still selling the exact same product while I was in prison for selling that product, and they had no license either. And uh, and then after that, though, I just kept my mouth quiet about anything having to do with politics. And I still had these libertarian volunteerist views, but didn't want any trouble in my life. And then, uh, I don't know, another uh, almost a decade later, Bitcoin came along, and it was just far too exciting for me to keep my mouth shut about because I really felt like Bitcoin was kryptonite to the state. So anybody. 
I learned overseas there's people who don't know Superman and don't know what kryptonite is, but for you know, most Americans will know, but other people, Superman is like basically God. He can do anything and everything, but his weakness is kryptonite, which is this glowing rock, and it'll kill him. And like my hope and my theory, and I, I still think it's likely to be true at some point, that cryptocurrencies can basically be kryptonite to government control of peaceful people, and I'm really excited to, to make that kryptonite more effective against the state. And uh, so it was too exciting for me to be quiet about Bitcoin, and so I did anything and everything I could to tell people about Bitcoin, put up the world's first Bitcoin billboard, paid for radio ads on more than 100 radio stations across America advertising, and this is all back in 2011 when you know, Bitcoin was, you know, one, two, three, four, five dollars each uh, for that sort of thing, and it's like the first website to accept Bitcoin for payments, and, uh, and then a lot of people, to nowadays they think, oh, Rogers, created Bitcoin Cash. I had nothing to do with the creation of Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. I was just an effective marketer of both, but I'm not a maximalist for either one. I, I put up the seed money to start uh, XRP. I put up the seed money to start uh, Zcoin. I was the almost the first round for Zcash. I was one of the first guys to take a big stake in Monero. Like I, I'm a fan of anything that works. And so uh, I'm just also a good marketer. So I guess that's why most recently people know me for Bitcoin Cash activity. But uh, I like anything that works and I'm not a Bitcoin Cash maximalist or anything else. Like I'm a, a individual freedom and individual self-control maximalist. I want people to have the most control of their own lives they possibly can. And technology, I think, is a great way to help empower individuals to have more control of their own lives. And that's why here I am, almost 13 years after I got involved in Bitcoin for the first time now, uh, still promoting it today. Well, I, these are de defining characteristics about a, a life well lived, and I appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, both support of things that we talk about often, which are you know price or chart or something like that, as far as uh, to uh, provide reward for risk. I think it was interesting that you said something about the pricing signals. You know, uh, if you have um, uh, valuation, uh, a value of something, whether it's feathers or clams or silver or metals and things like that. It really is the market that's giving signal about is that valuable? Is it social consensus? You know, this is agreed to be a trade or a barter tool. Um, I, I like that a lot. Uh, what are your opinions when it comes to, let's you know, move forward to uh, things like DEXs, uh, where they have uh, price signals from liquidity being available or trade back and forth. What are your opinions about the market signal um, there versus something that might be government controlled? So in communism, you know, they would set the price or price fix. Or in a monopoly, you, there's no competition. They've been bought out, uh, so there's no competition, and the signal can be anything that you choose uh, to provide the service or the good. What are your opinions when it comes to some of these innovations uh, regarding DEXs and their popularity? Yeah, the, the less control politicians have over something, the better in my book. And I'll also point out that, like, related when, in terms of price signals, if you charge a if you run a business and you charge a higher price than all your competitors, the government will prosecute you for price gouging. Mm. If you charge a lower price than everybody else, they'll charge you with like cutthroat competition or dumping. <laughs> and if you charge the same price as everybody else, they'll charge you with collusion and price fixing. And so, like, <laughs> no matter what price you charge, they can come after you and cause a hard time for for you and your business. And uh, but in regards to these dexes, great. The more stuff out there that people can buy and sell things and trade and swap from one currency to another freely without permission, the better in my book. Thank you for that. Uh, so we kind of crossed paths. You had said something about Santa Clara and where your original business was located. Uh, I moved to Santa Clara in 2006. Right when we, I left. <laughs> right about the same time that you were uh, out, I was in. And uh, at that time, I was more in the medical field, so I worked at Casa Permanente right next to now where Apple is located. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I liked about the, my change of environment was the culture of uh, innovators and uh, either venture capitalists uh, basically trying to create a new product or service to serve the world. I liked that quite a bit. So I, I transitioned from a farming kid to a military guy. We talk about military in a, in a few moments. But uh, then to medical service and you know, just trying to basically do good for uh, a wider population. And then I did get into entrepreneurism uh, because of software uh, developers. Um, can you comment a little bit, you know, outside of cryptocurrency, which again, a topic that we're, you're known for, can you comment about like uh, the public good, you know, like providing platforms for maybe social media content, uh, some of the, the filtering. Um, there's a trade-off as far as I've seen is you have a bigger uh, uh, ability or a broader ability to speak. It's not just standing on a box in the public square. It's not just within earshot. So you have further reach, but you can also very quickly be censored uh, do you have any commentary about cryptography uh, enabled social media platforms or how to get message out to a broader uh, audience than maybe some of the current platforms offer? Yeah, the way I kind of look at it is just post your content everywhere. 
and the more eyeballs will see it, especially if you like and, and, and agree with the content that you're putting out, which I hope you do about your own content. Mm -hmm. Post it everywhere. Post it on Twitter, post it on Facebook, post it on Mastodon, post it on you know all the new you know social medias that are coming out there. There's so many of them now, you can't even keep up, but the more you post out, the more likely people are to, to, to see the content that you're putting out there. So, and it, the censorship I find incredibly frustrating though, like it really, really frustrating. How do you get around that? I don't know. Um, it's a chick, it's a chicken and egg issue with any new platform, right? How do you get the users? Well, you get the users once you already have the users. And how do you deal with that? I, I, I don't have a, a magic solution for that. But one really fun tool, which maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, is called cashrain.com, where you can kind of pay people for engagement on these social media platforms using cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. But it's real engagement with real people, and it's a, a pretty neat advertising platform. So whether you're advertising a product or just an idea, it's a pretty darn interesting way to, to get more uh, attention to cashrain.com at that website. Cashrain. So I've seen uh, uh, Elon since his purchase of Twitter and converting it to X and you know, it's the idea that he's embracing a broader uh, audience, you know, people that actually want to put things out without censorship. Uh, and I think that cryptography does uh, help assist with that. So cashrain.com uh, was the name of the website. Yeah. Um, can you comment um, about, you know, again, I, I, I want to uh, applaud uh, people can fade into obscurity you know, for different reasons. They basically just, maybe in the youth of their life, they're willing to put up the fight. You put up the fight for quite some time. Uh, what do you see uh, as like uh, advice for people that are trying to make content like myself or my friends? Well, you know, other than just post everywhere, create content uh, maybe for distribution, uh, do you think that in-person events like today, like this past week, are useful? Uh, because I try to be a bridge builder and I think you've done quite well in those ways. Yeah, in-person events absolutely make a big difference. To be honest, if, if you had just sent me a, a text message or an email or something saying, hey, let's do a Zoom interview or something, I'd probably say, sorry, I'm, I'm busy with life. But uh, we got to meet in person, got to talk a little bit. Oh, here's a super smart guy that can see what's going on. And you, know, you sent me some very nice compliments as well, which didn't hurt, but uh, here we are. And so in face-to-face -face, in-person meetings absolutely make a big, big, big difference. And uh, we're not in this digital world yet where everything's in cyberspace. Like there's, there's a lot to be said for in-person meetings. I think it's great that you engage uh, more than just one side of a topic. So in politics, as the presidential election in the states at least are going to come up, I think there's going to be a lot of polarizing, no matter who the candidates are. It happens every cycle. Guaranteed. Guaranteed, <laughs> right? And you can have a sense of ostracization or that you're uh, not relevant to your friend group because of politics. Now we have things like, uh, you know, uh, how, what type of business are you creating? What kind of uh, cryptocurrency are you supporting? You said something about maximalism, but it was really interesting that you had such a broad uh, a portfolio as far as what things you've invested into cryptocurrencies. So you, uh, like you said, you were known and still are known as really the leader as far as the, 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 the voice that's out there for this Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash or other things. Can you comment a little bit about like this recent uh, XRP Ripple case and some of the case law. You, do you think that that's useful to, um, like like and Andrew is saying something about go where your money is treated best. You're saying something about maybe having two or three passports is useful, basically so you have options. Uh, but some people are you know fighting through the bureaucracy of our governments that we live under. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I think maybe some of it's has to like you can fight and you can fight as hard as you want but sometimes it's just a losing battle and so maybe sometimes a better a more effective strategy is to stop fighting with whatever you're fighting and then switch on focusing on something else and when i look at the sec stuff like i want nothing to do with any of that i'm not going to be able to move the needle there maybe i can troll some sec guy on twitter here and there but like I, if anything it's just going to make him mad at me maybe the sec is going to come after me and like another example actually uh, i didn't tell on stage today like i recently came within an Razor thin margin of being criminally prosecuted by the Federal Election Commission. Why, you may ask? Because I, as a non American, while I was still an American and then continued after I stopped being American, I was donating money to a YouTuber called uh, Adam Kokesh, whose videos I really like and enjoy. And at one point, he ran with his running mate of John McAfee for not president of the United States. And apparently, the amount of money I gave him over the years was more than whatever the threshold, which might be zero dollars for non-Americans, but they were looking into prosecuting me for being a foreigner, interfering in American elections, because I gave money to a guy who ran for not president of the United States on the platform if he would have an orderly dissolution of the federal government if he were to you know, somehow be elected. And I think he got eighth place in the libertarian primaries, and then the eventual libertarian candidate got like, you know, one percent of the vote or something like that. So like, 
And apparently there's some panel where they have a hearing and they decide whether or not to criminally prosecute me. And there's four people on the panel and the panel is deadlocked two to two as to whether or not to criminally prosecute me. And apparently when it's a deadlock, the default is not to prosecute. And I thought, oh, thank God. I didn't want to deal with another criminal prosecution. And I, I thought that was so close. Uh, and my friend said, no, Roger, you should be happy. I said, why should I be happy? He goes, yeah, that's the best absolute, that's the absolute best result you could have possibly had. I said, how is that the best result? It was so close, I almost got criminally prosecuted. He goes, no, you pissed off the maximum number of them that you possibly could, and there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> okay, maybe that is an okay way to look at it, so. Well, we hear these things that, you know, it kind of gives you the sense of, oh, they're on our side, uh, you know, or, you know, or they're against us, so it polarizes the population uh, on the decisions of basically people sitting in power. Uh, and let me tell you how big the scam was too. The, yeah. the lawyer I had to hire to help defend me from the Federal Election Commission was the former head of the Federal Election Commission. <laughs> so it's just like in one door and out the other, and so he's paying to protect me from his buddy. I'm sure he's friends with the current uh, Federal Election Commissioner, so yeah, the whole, the whole thing's just a racket. So. It's interesting, I see that Coinbase has their case, XRP has partial win uh, recently. Uh, there's other people that at least are more public and whether they're just garnering uh, for votes and support, uh, whether it's uh, Patrick McHenry or Tom Emmers, I think as well, inside of our uh, uh, offices uh, in the United States. But um, you know, do you think that the tide is, is moving toward their market signal is everyone can participate? You know, you said something about the value of money. Um, Citizen United had said that money is speech, you know? So is this speech to be able to use a cryptocurrency and transact with others? Do you agree with a, a peer to peer kind of uh, structure? Money, absolutely, without any doubt whatsoever, is a form of communication. Whether you want to call it speech or, or communication, it is. And there's a fantastic book or a YouTube video called I Pencil. And for anybody that hasn't watched that, you know, go and watch that after this. It's the story of a pencil told from the point of view of a pencil. And the pencil makes the claim that there's not a single human being alive on the planet that knows how to make me as a pencil. And at first you think everybody knows how to make a pencil. It's so easy, it's just a pencil, but no. It goes into detail of like, you know, you need the yellow paint on the, on the outside and the yellow comes from sulfur dug up somewhere else and then the wood is from trees chopped down and they use chainsaws to chop down the trees, but the chainsaws are made from iron and the iron ore is dug from somewhere else in the earth. And then the chainsaws run on gasoline and the gasoline comes from oil in the Middle East, but then shipped on tankers to refineries. And then like the little metal tip on the end of the pencil comes from dug up somewhere else on the earth. And then the rubber's from rubber trees in, in Indonesia and they refine it in some rubber factory. And then the people that are working at the factory need tools from somewhere else. And it goes into all this detail. And by the end of this, you realize, my God, there's not a single person alive on the planet that knows how to make a pencil. But the communication for how to make that pencil is the money that transfers from all these millions of people that come together to cooperate without knowing each other, without exchanging a single word, yet somehow they come together to make not just things as simple as pencils, but things like iPhones and cars and Teslas and everything in the entire world. And it's the money that's the communication tool that enables all of that. And so anytime government is messing with the money, they're messing with the communication that enables people to communicate with each other to make all these wonderful, wonderful things that we have all over the world. And so don't mess with the money. And so the way to make government stop messing with the money is through technology, not through begging politicians. I appreciate that. Like I said, market signals, I think it goes to uh, allocation, malallocation of uh, resources or capital. Yeah. Uh, again, Elon Musk has made commentary about you know the capitalists are the ones that, that uh, decide at allocate risk the resources. Peril. Yeah, at their own risk and peril. At their risk how and to peril. allocate those resources? Yeah, okay, that's great. I appreciate that. All right, guys. Uh, so unfortunately, Mr. Rivera had to step away to sign some papers, and I'm not sure he's going to be back in time before this room uh, needs to be turned over to the next uh, next event. We'll try and catch up later, uh, maybe to follow up some of those extra questions. Uh, until then, uh, hit like, hit subscribe, and repost this content. I think it's useful for people to have an understanding of his perspective. And uh, again, I appreciate him taking the time to have this interview with us. Uh, thanks again. See you on the next episode.